Today I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And uh, we are really literally coming now, I have to tell you, this is the portion of Scripture of 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, when we get down in our, in our um, Scripture reading, we've been reading it for weeks now, we're going to get to verse 9, which ends this section. And I have, to, I have to confess, I have been so waiting uh, for verse 9. In fact, all of the previous teachings uh, were all preparation for verse 9. And uh, that's where we're at today. So we're looking at a message entitled, What You Really Need to Know. It's like a mini-series that has happened in 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, but we're looking at what you need to know in these last days. And all that is right there in verse 9. But um, one more thing before we get going today. Let's pray once again, as we did last Wednesday and last Thursday. Let's pray for our nation's leaders all around the world. Heavenly Father, I pray right now for our president and vice president and our cabinet and our administration. I pray from, Lord, the leader of our nation, President Trump. Lord, to our local mayor and our city council. And Lord, the governors across this nation, they've got to make big decisions. They've got to make decisions, Lord, that none of us would want to make. But this hour has been thrust upon them. We pray for leaders, prime ministers, kings. We pray, Father, for rulers in the world around us that you would use them and speak to them. And just as I heard this morning coming down to the church that there are corporations here in the United States, some of the biggest companies in the world that have chosen to get together and to work with our government on how to make things better and how to create solutions and how to meet the needs and the demands that are upon not only our, our nation but the world. And some of those great corporations are retooling their manufacturing facilities to make masks and to make ventilators and to uh, produce gloves and all of these things, that is awesome. Coming together, and Lord, we just praise you. We ask that you, Lord, also would hear from the church. It is so obvious at this hour. The theaters have been shut down. Hollywood's not making movies. The normal stuff that's going on, a lot of voices has, have been silenced but one, the great hour right now upon us is the fact that the church is speaking all around the world at this moment. And with all of the silence and people gathered together in freeways empty, villages, towns, cities, quiet. Maybe, God, you have called us to this moment. You may not have caused the coronavirus, but you are certainly using it and we pray, Lord, that right now in our homes, all around the world, as the church was born in the home, during our time, as we'll study today, maybe, just maybe, during this global hour, the church might get raptured up out of their home to meet you in the air. We pray, Lord, now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Second Peter chapter 2, and I'm just obviously going to read through the scriptures and uh, you can follow along. And it begins, 2 Peter chapter 2, you guys know it well if you've been joining us. Verse 4, Peter says, For or since God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one out of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood of the world or upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, that Righteous man dwelling among them was tormented or had his soul tormented from day to day by seeing and hearing their evil deeds. And here's where we end our mini-series. This is the push of it all. Then, 
This is an, an announcement of, in light of all that you've heard, this is what God is doing. And this is what God is doing now in America and the world. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under the punishment for the day of judgment. That's the thrust of this entire series. That small little verse, verse 9, is the very power and announcement to what he's been teaching. You guys know previously, and I don't want to spend much time on it because we've got a lot of ground to cover, and I encourage you to uh, take notes today. But in verse 4, we saw that uh, our enemies really is something that we really need to know about and that they're not human. Remember, we studied that in detail, all about the angelic realm, that they're spirit beings. He warns in the Bible that they were judged that they reside in a, in a realm altogether different than what you and I know. That the Bible announces there are angelic beings, there are spirit beings who reside in a realm, a world altogether strange to us as mortals. Angels are real, said Jesus. Angels are real, says the Bible. And then lastly in that point regarding our enemy that is not human is the fact that they're being held, many of them are being held in contempt. That is, God says that they are reserved unto the day of judgment. And then secondly, we saw in verse five that we have a mission. And that as believers all around the world, and perhaps more now than ever before, our mission is an urgent mission. And we saw three things about that. That that mission is to pronounce judgment. And I know that's uncomfortable for us. None of us want to walk around pronouncing judgment on people, nor are we called to do that. But we are invited by the Bible to announce to the unbelieving world that God judges sin. And we read a moment ago that there was the world of the angelic realm that had sinned, angels that had fallen. We don't know how many. The Bible says one third of the angels were deceived by Lucifer, Satan, and they sinned, they fell. But also those of Noah's day, when God delivered Noah and his family out of the time of the great flood, but those who rejected God were swept away. So we're talking about judgment and we're being introduced to deliverance. And then we also saw the fact that in this judgment, there is the believer, you and I, that are to live our lives walking around living and being people that represent the word of God truly. And then we also saw that our mission uh, extends mercy. And this is amazing because church, we sat here several weeks ago and we went through that in detail and little did we know that we would be thrust now into this moment where we are extending mercy to our community and beyond. How this church, just one church, this one, one church in a community of many, but this one church has mobilized and has gone out and to show acts of mercy, acts of love regarding this urgent mission. This is pretty cool. Uh, the, the company that supplies bread to Disneyland and uh, bread to uh, some restaurants in the region, uh, they wound up uh, donating just tons and tons of bread to us and that bread's been going out to people in need. Mercy, the time is urgent. And all this is building up to our closing message of this section. And then last time together we saw the fact that it ends in uh, absolute completeness, that the Lord is coming. And the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back, that is in the mindset of so many people. It ought to be in the mindset of everybody. That Christ is coming back. And the Bible makes it very clear that it ends when Christ comes and delivers his church. And we saw last time in our final uh, study before leading to this moment, we saw that our identity is no longer our own. We're no longer us in Christ, that we are now Christians. And the fact that that happened to you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus is that the world is no longer us. This world is strange to us as believers. Have you, have you noticed that? Have you been reminded of that lately? You look around, the world is different. It's no longer in your heart as a believer. You may be tempted by the world. I, I get that. But you understand that you don't belong here anymore. And I absolutely revel in that. That the world is no longer us. We saw also that this culture is no longer us. 
We see things on TV. We hear things spoken. We see things uh, being broadcast or hear things on the radio, and we just push back. There's the Spirit of God in us, the Holy Spirit that we learned about on Wednesday night that pushes back from evil. And then we saw in closing that our life is no longer our own, that Christ now rules us. And it's a glorious truth. So church, dial down now on verse nine of the second chapter of Second Peter. Look at it again. Then the Lord knows how, number one, to deliver the godly out of temptations. And number two, to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. There is no doubt about it that Jesus Christ divides the world. I can mention any name in the world at any given time, and there's no problem. But the moment I mention Jesus, I've got people's attention. I've told you before, but I'll say it again. Whenever uh, my wife and I or family were watching a movie at a theater, and uh, somebody might say something, or maybe even on TV, somebody might say something that uses the uh, name of God in the wrong light, we respond publicly. No matter what it is, somebody might say, oh, Jesus, this, and we say, is Lord. And uh, we practice that. And and it's, it's kind of fun. It takes a moment where people don't even know what they're talking about, but they mention the name Jesus, and we redeem it by saying, is Lord. And that's the challenge for us today. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives? So friends, as we take our fourth and final look, it is this right now. What you really need to know, and specifically now verse nine about these last days, mark it down, is that the rapture is a biblical doctrine. You say, Jack, where do you get that from? Oh, look closely in verse nine. It says, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. This is a reference to the Lord coming for his people. And listen, it's twofold at the least. Number one, it's regarding the rapture. The Bible teaches that the rapture is something, and we'll see it in a moment, that is uh, throughout the Bible. And the rapture is an event that is very controversial. It should be, and the Bible said it would be. And the rapture doctrine is something that is very, very uh, dividing. When I say dividing, I mean it this way. I mean that it divides the believer from the unbeliever or the non-believer. When Jesus, Christ, when Jesus Christ comes suddenly, he will divide the believer from the unbeliever. And uh, the rapture will take place. And you're going to learn all about it this morning. And it's all based on that portion of verse 9. The Lord knows how to deliver you if you're a Christian. Listen, right now, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact of the matter is God has deposited a mark upon you, so to speak. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, he has marked you, sealed you until the day of redemption. What does that mean? It means that God looks, as it were, all around the world right now, and he can see those that are his. You know, we talk a lot about today regarding uh, identity and uh, facial recognition and hand recognition. Uh, You know, many of us, we can go in and out of customs now at our airports by just either looking at a screen. I remember not too long ago, I boarded a, a flight uh, I forget where, but it was either Frankfurt, Germany, or France. I, it doesn't matter. I was en route to somewhere, uh, and it just, the, it just looked at my face. I had my passport on me, but it, the scanner looked at my face, and a green light went on, and the customs door opened up, and I was able to board the aircraft. Identity. If man can identify man in the technology that we've created, then how much more can God absolutely identify us by the power of his Holy Spirit? And that's what he does. And you're marked as a believer. You might be sitting right there in your living room or your apartment right now, or wherever you're at in the world, and if you're trusting Jesus Christ, you are marked. Marked for a moment, I might add. The Bible tells us that that moment could be the rapture of the church. But first of all, let's do our homework. Let's get ready. I'm going to give you a lot of uh, verses of the Bible. I'm going to ask you to do your homework by writing them down. What you really need to know is the fact that the rapture is a biblical doctrine, and it begins, Jesus is the one that even introduces it. It begins in John 14, verse 1. Many of you know this, but maybe it's sweeter now to our ears than ever before. 
Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Everybody at home, get your finger ready. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go now to prepare a place for you. Where did he go? He went to heaven. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Listen to this. That where I am, heaven, there you may be also. And I want to ask you, if you're a skeptic in the rapture right now, I want to ask you this question. If Jesus Christ left, if Jesus went away to prepare a place for us, and he said he would do that, the question is, did he leave? After being resurrected from the tomb, did Jesus Christ ascend back to heaven? Yes. He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, where does the Bible say Jesus Christ is right now? In heaven. And he said, I'm going to leave heaven just long enough to come back and to receive you to myself. That wherever I am, heaven, you will be also. He's going to come and receive the believers at a particular time. I pray it's today. And he's going to receive them to himself and then deposit us in that place that he has been preparing. Now, a lot of people today want to argue about the rapture. For the life of me, I cannot figure that out. Because let's be honest, every Bible-believing Christian agrees and understands the rapture is a biblical doctrine. What they don't agree upon is the timing of it. And that's okay. We can disagree on the timing. Uh, you could be wrong about that, but I lovingly say uh, we could be raptured today. The doctrine of eminency, as we'll see in a moment, is something that teaches the Bible uh, could have this fulfillment happen to us today. And you need to know that. But I want to stress this, that the pulpit ministry of the church today needs to be very clear right now about hope. And it's not some pipe dream, it's not some silly thing to preach the fact that not only can we have, listen, not only can we have hope in the midst of persecution and in the uh, moment of devastation, we can have hope in the moment of pestilence, disease, viruses like we see around the world right now at this hour. But it's a hope that announces to us that Christ could come at any time. Listen, it's a hope that, that causes us to look up and it's a hope that keeps us going forward. None of us need to be afraid. Stop being afraid. We do not need to be afraid because it, first of all, it doesn't do anything. Uh, second of all, it, it, it doesn't make things better. It actually makes everything worse, but here's the main thing. When you realize that God has given you and I the opportunity to be alive at this time, and let's be honest, there are some who are sick. By the way, there are far many, more many people sick in the world of other things than the coronavirus. And some of them may die. You may, be, you may die. Do you trust Christ? Do you know Jesus? Here's the ultimate hope. Jesus said, if a man were to die believing in me, yet shall he live. Do you know that? The ultimate hope is having Christ now in your life. And Jesus saves. Jesus saves. You can drive downtown Los Angeles and there's a building. It's been there for I don't know how many decades. And atop that building and it's written in red, neon red, it says Jesus saves. And that's still true today. Jesus saves. But never should the pulpit at a time like this be a place of weakness, gloom, or apathy at any time. But in times like these, the pulpit ought to be all the more ablaze with truth. And that truth should point all Christians to the blessed hope it's called in the Bible, the rapture, the gathering of his church to himself at his return. Christ is coming. We need to get excited about that. And we'll soldier on until he comes, but we need to be looking up. But you might ask the question, how is he going to do this? Pastor Jack, you're saying in this first argument that the Bible teaches us that the rapture is a biblical doctrine and all that is true. And all these preceding verses speak to us about God separating the righteous from the unrighteous. But how's he going to do it? 
If it's a biblical doctrine, then does it explain in the Bible how it's going to happen? Oh, yes. Get your notes ready. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. The word in Greek is mysterion. It doesn't mean that Paul's making something up. It means it's a truth that has always been. It means that it's eternal. And you need to hear some of this. Listen, he is saying, I'm going to tell you something that has always been eternal, but it's being revealed publicly now. This is a great, great bit of hope and encouragement to us. We shall not all sleep. The word sleep in the Bible refers to the believer's body at the time of death. Allow me to change it for our English language. We shall not all die, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we, Paul says, we shall be changed. That's how he's going to do it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and I assume you do, maybe for some of you right now you're hearing it for the first time. Well, Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and he rose again from the dead. Even so, God will bring with him those who died in Jesus. Believers who, in these last 2,000 years, died trusting Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Their dead bodies will come out of the ground. Now the believer, listen, previously to this moment right now, when a believer dies, their body goes into the ground, but their spirit goes to be with the Lord. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's at, that's at a moment, instant of time at death. You go to be with Jesus at the moment of death. Isn't that good news? If you're a believer, the Bible says that Jesus that is coming for the church is going to resurrect those dead bodies. They're going to get brand new bodies, resurrected bodies. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. It's the word rapture in Latin. If you don't have a Latin Bible, you have in English the words caught up. Uh, Harpazo in in, uh, the Greek language, rapture in the Latin language. You're going to be caught up. The word means to be quickly, uh, almost violently, we could say, in a twinkling of an eye, caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds, it says here, and to meet him in the air. And thus we shall always, listen, this is key, always be with the Lord. Well, where was that? Where is that? John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. And the Bible says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And I want to make that word familiar to you today. Comfort one another with these words. Christ is coming back. Are you ready to meet him? You say, I don't know if I am. Then trust Jesus, having gone to the cross and dying there for your sins. The Bible says he rose again from the dead. He died in your place, my place. All of our sins were covered by Christ at the cross. But listen, here's the fine print. It's very important. Not everyone benefits from the crucifixion of Christ. Not everyone benefits from the resurrection of Christ. That great gift given to man for God's soul of the world that he gave, gifted the world, his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's a gift. But you must choose to receive that gift. Gifts are to be received It's tragic if somebody sends a gift back. I mean, that has just got to be one of the most ultimate rejections is for somebody to care enough to get you a gift and then for you to just throw it back. Return to sender in America is how that sounds. You just write across. You don't even want to open it. You just write, return to sender. And some people do that. Many people do that with the gospel. The gospel goes out and they say, I don't want it. No, listen, you need it. And believe me, when the day of separation comes and 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 is fulfilled, you're going to want to have that salvation of Christ. And here's another great reason why. 
In Philippians 3.20, the Bible says, for our citizenship. Some of your translations say conversation. I think it's the old King James that might say conversation. I like that. For our conversation is in heaven. Think about that for a moment. Of course, the word is politic. That's why in, in other translations of the Bible, it says citizenship. Every believer has a passport for heaven. It's our conversation now. It's how we think. It's how we talk. It's how we live. From which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing today. Who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. That's that rapture event, that instantaneous changing that we heard about a moment ago, that twinkling of an eye transformation according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. What a glorious promise. Yes, the rapture of the church is a biblical doctrine, and I'm just covering a few verses. Number two in our study, let's keep going, it's this. What you and I really need to know in the last days is that the rapture is the believer's hope is the believer's hope. Second Peter 2.9 says that he knows how to deliver. The word deliver means to extract or to take out of. It can be translated that he knows how to keep us through. But when we look specifically at the rapture, we know that it's a taking out of. For example, Noah was delivered out of the flood and carried above it. Daniel, listen, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or you know them as uh, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Daniel is a picture of the church, if you think about it. When the judgment came and Nebuchadnezzar said that these Hebrew boys or men are to burn to death for their faith in God, Daniel's not even mentioned. Daniel's not even in the narrative. It doesn't explain where Daniel's at. And he was the ringleader of those guys. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace and the Lord protected them through it, but Daniel was not even mentioned in it. And that might be a picture of the church and Israel. The church is removed from the coming tribulation period, which we are not in, ladies and gentlemen. This is not the tribulation period. So much junk on the internet about the timing of things. But God has promised to take Israel through that tribulation period, and there's no mention of the church during that period of time. Why? Because we are to have hope as the believer right now in this day and age regarding the rapture. The Bible tells us in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, this is, listen, this is incumbent upon every Christian. This is not an option. Every believer must have this attitude. And by the way, if you don't have this attitude, you need to change it. Not the Bible, your attitude. You need to embrace what God is saying. Titus 2.13 says, looking for the blessed hope. The word means scanning. You are to be scanning, searching, watching the horizon, looking. Imagine right now, there are some few in the world that have to be at work. The police are at work. The military is at work. The hospital is at work. Certain things are at work. While you're at work, you're to be scanning the horizon in your heart and mind, as it were, that Christ could come back today. It's the believer's hope. Most of the world is inside their house right now. And yet they're to be doing the exact same thing in the heart and in the mind. They're, they're to be looking and scanning the horizon for the return of Christ, as it were, in their attitude and in their lifestyle. The rapture was, is, and will always be until it happens. The believers longed for hope. That Holy Spirit in you longs to get you home. It's an amazing time. The Bible says, and we've read this often together, I just want to point a few things out to you. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 and 14, we read it. For if we believe, verse 14, uh, look ahead in 1 Thessalonians 4, 
14, for if we believe, look at verse 15, for this we say to you, you can keep reading there, that we who are alive and remain, listen to Paul, he said we three times there now, verse, look down, verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, that's the fourth time he says it, just a few verses, this, and by the way, remember, he's speaking 2,000 years ago. Every generation is to expect the blessed hope. And then uh, finally, uh, fifth time he says it, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Do you live like that? At any given time, he could come. It's exciting to think. Thirdly, if you're taking notes, mark it down. What you really need to know in these last days, according to verse 9, is that, listen, is that the rapture is the great motivator. It's a great motivator in our lives. And we know this is true in, in other areas of our lives, if you think about it. If we know something's coming, if we have an appointment, that motivates us. You and I have an appointment with the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. Now, I got to tell you, <laughs> I, I, you, know, it, you know I love reading C.S. Lewis. I don't know if you're a C.S. Lewis fan or not, and I, I know there's some things in there that he says uh, that's uh, difficult sometimes. I'm not saying C.S. Lewis is inspired writing. I'm saying C.S. Lewis is a genius, and if you've never read him, you need to read him, and you need to begin with mere Christianity. But in mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, the famous atheist out of Oxford University at the time, wound up coming to Christ. And C.S. Lewis became one of the greatest defenders of faith, logic, and reason for the church in the 19th century, 20th century. But one of the things that he said about Christianity after studying all the world religions is that he said Christianity could not have been made up. And then when he applied that logic to the entirety of the Bible, when he looked at Genesis all the way to Malachi, he concluded that the scriptures could never have been made up by man. And I want you to think about that the next time you look at the Bible. This Bible never would have been written by, a, by man and published and produced as man would do it because man would have glorified himself. Man would have made himself look good. The Bible is the very, very book that God, the Holy Spirit, wrote through man without error. Think about that, with no mistakes. And it actually condemns the very man who with quill or pen in hand wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It condemns him. The, if you had to pick a star nation out of the entire Bible, what nation is it? It's Israel. And yet everything about it is showing Israel's rejection of God's faithfulness, God's love, God's kindness. And yet the book ends and time ends with God saying that he will save Israel in the end, we have no promise. Listen, there is no promise in the Bible that Canada will be saved in the end. I have a lot of Canadian friends and I love Canada, but they're not going to be saved. America is not going to be saved in the end. There's only one nation that God promises in the Bible that is going to be saved through a time of great difficulty that is yet to come. And that one nation is the nation of Israel. And that is true from Genesis to Revelation. That's a powerful truth. You need to think about that. But the coming of Christ is a great motivator for the Christian. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved... Now we are children of God. I love that. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, technically what we shall be like. Will we be tall? Will we be short? Will we be, hey, I don't know, except this, it means resurrected. It means this body, this body of Jack's, yours, will be resurrected. Now look, I'm going to interrupt myself obviously here in the reading of this verse. I'll come back to it in a second. I sure hope and I assume that when I'm resurrected from the dead physically, 
that all of the things that were of the sinful world are washed away. I don't believe that someone who was born without a leg, as an example, will be resurrected with one leg. I believe all the ramifications of sin will be revealed and you will stand in perfection on the day of resurrection. He says, and he goes on, but we know this, that when he, Christ, is revealed, we shall be like him. Well, what does that mean? Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Listen, this is awesome. God inhabited a human body. The psalmist said, a body you have prepared for me. That's a messianic psalm. We're speaking of the Messiah. That, in fact, Israel, listen. Israel, listen to this. God would prepare the Messiah of Israel a human body. You say, well, everybody has a human body. The Messiah doesn't until he gets one. And the Bible says he gets one or he got one when he came into this world born of a virgin. We shall be like him, says the Bible, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Listen, more than ever, you want motivation? You want to, you want to hear a word right now? I'm going to tell you. You want to be motivated? The Lord could come back at any time, and I'll tell you this right now. Listen, you want a motivator? The Bible says if you believe Christ could come back, that motivation is a result or resulted in a life being lived in righteousness. The word righteousness intimidates us, and it shouldn't. The word righteousness means that we decide to do the right thing. We make the right decision. We ponder, we pause, we hold off, and then we do the right thing. That's righteousness. All around the world, people have been stripped from entertainment in some ways, and they're with family. Did you know that's doing the right thing, by the way? Feeding your neighbors, checking on the elderly in your area the best you can, helping them, caring for them. Righteousness is to do the right thing. But don't think that you can do the wrong thing and go to heaven. Don't think that you can say that you're a Christian and go about doing the wrong thing and expect to go up in the rapture. Christians will go up in the rapture. He's coming for his own. And the understanding that he could come at any time is a great motivator because the fact of the matter is this, that because if Christ could come back at any time, I want to have my hands on that which glorifies God. I want to have my money invested in the things that glorify God. I want to spend my time in things that will glorify God. That is very important. So the great rapture is a great motivator. should be an inspiration. should cause vision. It's interesting to, uh, to consider. Think this for a moment. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, the Bible there says, and I'm going to read uh, this portion out of the New Living Translation. It's... It's not an actual Bible verse. It is a translation of a Bible verse. But it's clear right here. Hebrews 10, 24 starts there by saying, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and of good works. Verse 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together except for coronavirus. <laughs> But that's why we're doing these services, to bring it to your home. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get back together again. Can you imagine? I can guarantee you that we'll get back together again. You say, oh, we're going to definitely get back together at church? Now that I don't know. But for every believer, we're going to get together again. If the Lord comes back, think of it, during this message, or maybe this week, I don't know. He, he's not going to tell us when. He just said to be ready. We'll be together. What a great statement. Wow. But don't neglect the gathering or the meeting together as some, 
but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. That verse implies, listen, I'm going to pause for effect. That verse assumes that you are looking for his coming. That you look around the world and you sense something's up. Listen, Romans 13, verse 11. And do this, that's a command. Do this, the Greek word is a command. Do this, knowing the time, that now it is the high time to awake out of sleep, that is, out of apathy. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Listen to this, the night is far spent. 2,000 years have gone by. I'm gonna submit to you right now that the night is far spent. And the day is at hand, says the Bible. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. That's how you be ready and that's how you get ready by the motivation that Christ is coming. Fourthly, under this, regarding the church and you and I in these last days and what you and I really need to know is that the rapture promotes holy living. Sounds much like the other about motivation, but holy living. He says in verse 9 of 2 Peter, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. What a tremendous statement. So what does that, uh, what does that look like? How do we play that out in life? I, I want all of you to write this down. This is very important. Very important passions indeed. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Starting there, listen to this. Colossians 3, verse 1. The Bible says... If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Sounds like John 14, doesn't it? Seated at the right hand of God. Number two, verse two. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Verse three. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse four. Listen to this. When. Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. That's Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. That's an awesome statement. A remarkable statement. For time's sake, I'm going to move. By the way, while I'm at it, and while times are different than normal, uh, wherever you're at in the world, you can get our notes online sent to you before service and you, you'll be able to tell in a moment that on page seven and on the fourth point I'm going to move a little bit I'm just giving you that as a as a follow along because you might say where's he going where's he going but you look at Hebrews 9 verse 28 right there on the notes listen to this so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many he said Jack didn't he die for everybody oh yes he died for everybody but as I said earlier, not all benefit from it, but many do. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. Apart from sin, that is, the sin issue is over. That happened at the cross for salvation. Now you take that verse and it correlates perfectly with 2 Peter 2.9. God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation, out of a time of great testing and great difficulty. And that's a remarkable truth. Next, four, uh, in our fourth argument, I think we're looking, this should be number five now in our consideration. So uh, look at it, it's 4E in your notes. What you and I really need to know in these last days is that the rapture is the great separator. And I won't spend much time on this, but the rapture will separate. The Bible tells us all of a sudden, when Christ comes, there'll be people that will be vanishing. Instantly transformed into the spirit realm, gone. Now that sounds like a fantasy. That sounds like a story. That sounds crazy. And yet, you know what? It's happened in the Bible before. Elijah was taken up into heaven. The Bible tells us Enoch was taken up. The Bible tells us even that Philip was 
picked up from the earth and taken to another location in the book of Acts by the Holy Spirit. There's a coming separation. And I think right now as families are gathered together around the world and maybe couples are gathered together around the world, you think about the separation that's going to happen someday because, you know, there's family members that do not believe. And there's going to be a family in heaven All around the world, those of us who are believers, we are knit together, we're glued together by the Holy Spirit, and we are family. Let's be honest. Those of you who know what I'm talking about, we are more family than blood family. But there are those even on our own, we may be married to someone, or we may have children or parents that don't know the Lord, and they refuse to know the Lord. Well, there's a day of separation coming. When God will divide. Because it says in verse 9 of Peter that he can know also the time when he reserves the unjust under the punishment of the day. But there's a great separation. Galatians chapter 5 verse 5 says, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. That implies those that are not waiting, they do not go. I personally believe that every true Christian will go because I believe that every true Christian will be compelled by the Holy Spirit to be watching and waiting. And as I say that, you need to really be judging your own heart about the excitement level the return of Christ generates in your heart. You know how we've seen like science programs or maybe in the lab where we strap little electrodes, you know, to someone's brain or head, I should say. And uh, you can record the movement and they'll show them pictures and it gets all lively about something and then it shows them a river flowing through the meadow and their brainwave activity goes down. So when I talk to you about prayer and trust in the Lord, it's like, yeah, awesome. And then when I talk to you about the verses that say Jesus could come back today at any moment, the brainwave activity increases It's like, yes, but if today you're saying, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. I don't know if I'd like that. That scares me. Why? Why? This may be a dumb analogy, but, um, you know, growing up, little kid believing in Santa Claus, you, what'd you, what, would you, what did I do? What did you do with the calendar? You counted the days down to the 24th. You couldn't, listen, you went to bed on Christmas Eve and you couldn't even sleep. I confess, man, I'm 62 years old. I remember it like yesterday. Yeah, I couldn't fall asleep. And then finally, when I did fall asleep, it wasn't for long because I would get up so early and I remember my mom and dad yelling at me saying, get back to bed. A lot of people today are saying, get that thinking out of your thought. Jesus isn't coming back. Watch out for that. No, you should be excited. You should get excited. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Listen to this. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Hey, I will talk more about this on Wednesday night. But all around the world right now, this is, I believe, one of those times. I believe the times and the seasons are being announced by God to the world right now, and he happens to be using this virus. He's got everyone's attention. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, Now listen, he's speaking to believers. So what is it that they know? For when they say, not you, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that that day should overtake you as a thief. See, don't let anybody tell you that nobody can know when the Lord's coming. Listen, let's be very, very careful and specific. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but the Bible says that every believer will discern the times and the seasons. What does that mean? 
It means that you're going to have a feeling, a sense. You're going to have an awareness. You don't know the day or the hour, but you're thinking, this is a dynamic time. This is a global time. And I want to submit to you right now, friends, I want to tell you that radio is still happening, Christian radio all around the world. Today being the Lord's Day Sunday, there's Christian television broadcasting going on around the world. And more than ever, there are churches around the world live streaming and going YouTube live and Facebook live with sermons. Now, I don't know the numbers. It's just not in my realm of, of uh, figuring this out. But I'm hearing from other pastors and I'm hearing from our own team that we're seeing more viewership than ever before since this virus. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But I know this. That in the 21st century, right here, right now, I'm able to speak to a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, a million more people, maybe more. I think of tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be Monday. And in the United States, there's something called Sirius XM Radio. And uh, our program is broadcast five days a week on that station that covers the entire nation. And by the way, I'm very grateful for the individuals who make that happen. And they have a 25 million subscriber membership list. Now, not all 25 million people are tuning into our program, but they could. By the way, that's at 1.30 <laughs> Pacific time or New York time. I forget whatever time it is. It doesn't matter. It covers the nation. 4.30, I think, New York time. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. For therefore, let us not sleep as others do, apathy. But let us watch and be sober. Do you hear that? You see how that dovetails into our message? Watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, spiritually speaking. To those who get drunk, they get drunk at night. It means people try to hide their sin. But, verse 8, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to this, who died for us, that whether we are alive or we die, we should always live together with him. What an awesome truth that is. Look at your notes. 4F is what we're looking at now. And that is the rapture delivers us from the wrath. It says here in verse 9 of 2 Peter, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. The Christian will never see a day of judge, judgment. Jesus said so. It's an amazing statement. Think of that for a moment. This is so spectacular. I, because of Jesus, will never suffer wrath, that is the wrath of God, in my life, ever. There's, listen, I'm going to be very honest with you. If the rapture doesn't happen today and I, for whatever reason, wind up in the hospital, I'm not going to like that, but I'm going to make it, listen, listen to me, I'm going to make it, whatever it is, heart attack, coronavirus, get hit by a truck, doesn't matter, whatever throws me into the hospital, you know what I know? I don't like needles, I don't like getting poked on, and um, I don't like people touching stuff that ought not to be touched. But this I know. I'm going to make it. You say, well, aren't you, Mr. Positive? <laughs> yes, I am, for this reason. If I die in that hospital bed or on that street or right here on this podium or in my sleep, I'm going to make it. I'm going straight to heaven. 
Why? How can I be so sure? Because the wrath of God that was ordered against my sins, the Bible says Jesus took upon himself at his cross for me, for you. And the Bible says, in fact, I mentioned this on Wednesday, I think. Those who trust Christ pass from judgment to life. Think about that. No wrath for the believer. None, ever, for the believer. And here in verse nine is the great promise. The Bible tells us, listen, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19. It's an amazing statement. Now I, listen, scholars that are out there watching and reading this, you're gonna say, that applies to Israel. It certainly does. But you cannot deny that the theology of Isaiah 26, 19 to 21 is also mirroring, mirrors the promise of the New Testament. Your dead, God is speaking, your dead shall live together with my dead body they shall arise. Think of Christ's resurrection. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. Think about those who have died in Christ. Their bodies have turned to dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs. What happens to dew in the morning when the sun comes up? That's those droplets of water upon the leaf of a plant or of an herb. If you, if you had the patience to sit there and watch for a moment that leaf or that petal with the droplet of dew on it, You'd have to stare and stare and stare and watch and watch and watch. You know what would happen? It gets smaller and smaller and smaller until there's no more water on that leaf or on that petal. Where did it go? It evaporated right up back into the heavens, into the atmosphere. And the earth shall cast out the dead. Look at verse 20. Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you and hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. What indignation? Verse 21. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The wrath of God levied against a Christ-rejecting world will have no consequence to the church. Luke 21, verse 35. Luke 21, 35, there begins. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, Jesus is speaking. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. Wow. Verse 37. Blessed are those servants who, when the master, when he comes, will find them watching. Verse 40, therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect him. What a tremendous truth that is. Christ is coming back at a time that you don't know the day or the hour, but you can know the times and the seasons. Let me tell you something right now. I'll be brutally honest. When the doctor says, you're sick, you've got cancer, it doesn't look good, set your house in order, you need to hear this from the Lord. If that's what the doctor says, then you need to understand something. You need to understand that you need to get ready. That's merciful. That's mercy. Rather than dropping dead in an instant where there's instant judgment if you think about it. But if you find yourself sick today, battling, Illness, cancer, diseases, leukemia, whatever it might be. May the Lord Jesus Christ heal you now. May he heal you radically in his name because he does that when he chooses to do it. But if you're not a Christian, I, I mean this with all affection. If you're not a Christian and you get healed by chemotherapy or by treatment, well, you know, I'm kind of glad for you. Not totally. I said, Jack, how can you say that? Because if you get better and you feel great and you just go on living without Christ, 
you're still going to die. I'm going to die. But if you understand that the announcement is given that you need to get ready to meet your master and you set your house in order, then I can tell you this, you'll be ready to meet him at his coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Those who have died in Christ, he'll bring with him. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you, wherever you're at right now, can you just say, thank you, God? That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. He did not appoint us to wrath. That's a promise of God. You can get excited. Uh, the world's too quiet at this moment. It's quiet in here. It's quiet outside. That's a reason to shout. My daughter told me last night, by the way, I don't know where this is ha gonna happen today, but somewhere in the world, I don't know if it's Italy or what, but uh, somebody's trying to start some movement about at a certain time, people open up their windows or their doors in the world and uh, either begin to cheer, clap, or sing, or some, make some noise, make some kind of noise uh, in a show of, of solidarity and that we're still here. <laughs> well, hey, I'm praying for the moment that when the church on earth will no longer have a voice, will no longer be streaming online, will no longer be on Facebook Live or YouTube and teaching the Bible via the platform because the church will have been silenced on earth. Why? Because we're not here. We're not here anymore. Because he didn't appoint us to wrath. Next, this is 4G in your notes, is that the rapture belongs to the church. It's exclusively that of the church. And um, there's verses there that you can read, John 14 and 1 Thessalonians 4. And um, I'm going to read a lot more to you in a moment, but listen to this. It's exclusively reserved for the church. 1 Thessalonians 4.14. 4, you know it, we've read it before. That if we believe that Jesus died and rose again from the dead, even so God will bring with those who sleep or died in Jesus. Remember that? We read it a moment ago. The trumpet blast, we'll go up and meet them in the air if it's at our time when we're alive. But it belongs to the church. And there's a portion of scripture that substantiates that perfectly. It's Revelation 4.1. Revelation 4.1 says this. After these things, says John, after these things, behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. By the way, John, this is the book of Revelation. John is speaking of the church. And by the way, John is never again seen on earth and neither is the church never again seen on earth from this moment on. Verse two, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper, a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. I do not understand that because the word emerald is green color, a rainbow of green. I don't get it, but that's okay. I'll get it when I see it. Verse four, and around the throne were 24 elders and on the thrones we, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads and from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices 
And the seven lampstands of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This is a picture of heaven. Before the throne, there was the sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. That ought to freak you out. What a tremendous picture that is. Verse 7, the first living creature was like a lion. So watch this, eyes around. So it has a face like a lion. Okay. The second living creature has that of a calf. The third living creature had a face of a man. And the fourth living creature was that of a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him, that is God, and uh, who sits on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne. And this is what they say. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you were created, or you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. I want to join this, and we're just about ready to wrap this up. Revelation 19 goes on to tell us that there was a great multitude there. Going on to verse 9 and wrapping this up, on your notes, it's 4H, is that the rapture is the ultimate act of God's mercy for us. In Luke 21, 34, it says, be careful because your hearts could be weighed down. Oh, listen, this is now. This is today. Jesus said as we approach the end, be careful, listen, be careful because your hearts could be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties of life. And that day will close in on you unexpectedly like a trap. Don't worry, friends. Don't worry. God's got this. This hasn't missed his preview. This hasn't missed his care. This world event is not outside of God's knowledge. He knows. You might be saying, what's God going to do? What's God going to do? And can't you hear God saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with what you're seeing in the world around you? Will you trust me? Will you put your faith in me? I think that's what he's saying in a great act of mercy. And then also, this is 4I in our notes, is the rapture is the believer's DNA. The believer's DNA is rapture. It's in us. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, just a little bit to the left of where we're studying, 2 Peter 2, 1, the Bible says, there, there will be also, there will be false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. He goes on to tell us what they are. I mean, this is big, this is big stuff. Listen to this. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days. Listen, everybody, if you're sleeping, wake up, we're almost done. This is the big deal. In the last days, you're going to know it's the last days because there's going to be people who traffic in religious circles who are known to God to be false teachers. And how do we find them? How do we know them? Well, he says right here, they're going to scoff in the last days, walking according to their own lust. That word means they actually live one. Look, they live like this in front of the camera and they live an alternative lifestyle off camera. They're fakes. But this is what they say. Where's the promise of his coming? Isn't that amazing? I don't believe it. Jesus said in Matthew 14, or excuse me, Matthew 24. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him so doing, that is being faithful. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. Listen. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master delays his return. 
Watch the result of that theology. And begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come in a day when he's not looking for him and in an hour when he's not aware. And he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then here's where we end. The rapture is the answer to expectancy. Expectancy. We have pictures of this in our world. Expectancy. When a woman becomes pregnant, she's going to be pregnant. First of all, I should say she is pregnant the moment she becomes pregnant. Boy, that's a whole topic we don't have time to go into right now. I'll just say this. When science designed by God collides in the in the way that God has designed it. I'm not talking about a collision on the freeway like an accident. When God ordained science meets instantaneous, a human being is created. Expectancy, that woman, she doesn't even know it yet. She's pregnant. Conception has taken place. Living sperm collides with a living egg Living, living life explodes scientifically. And I know our culture wants to argue that. Oh, you know what? A little bit of a diversion on this. Did you know that in the United States that there's been a decree? We just heard it this last week but by our U.S. Surgeon General. Listen. Because of the preciousness of the need of hospitals and care centers. All elective procedures have been canceled. Physicians and hospitals are being told do not perform any elective or non-essential surgeries or procedures. Why? Because the resources are needed to confront the coronavirus. Guess what? Elective abortions cannot be performed under that rule. All across America right now. You can fight with me all you want. You can send me hate mail. You can threaten me all you want. Listen, I survived an abortion. I already died. I was slated to die. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hunt you down, Pastor. You upset me. Listen, listen. You know what? I, I'm 62 years old, but in a, in a way, my life is only Jesus' life. I was never supposed to be in this world in the first place. I'm here by God's grace and God's mercy. But I want to tell you something right now. Do you think maybe, is it possible for a moment that we have prayed for revival for decades, and God is bringing it, and he's using a virus. He's not causing the virus. He's using it. And maybe, listen, maybe revival is God's people doing the right thing, which is called righteousness, and that is a revival. But I don't believe God's going to do a revival in America until America stops killing babies. That's true in the Old Testament, and it's true in the New. God condemned Israel for killing their firstborn children. And all of a sudden, everything's sequestered in America, and babies are not being aborted. What do you think about that? I think that's pretty awesome. I think that's pretty awesome. There's going to be, oh my goodness, if the Lord allows us to live on, we are going to meet kids someday that were in the womb or conceived during this coronavirus season. I don't know if their name will be Corona or not, but uh, somehow they'll be celebrated. Because maybe... Maybe some incredible greatness and goodness will come out of this time. I have no doubt about that, actually. 
expectancy. And we end with that verse that we read earlier today, Titus 2.13. Are you looking for that blessed hope, my friend, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ? That's an incredible verse. It declares Jesus Christ as God. It declares Jesus Christ as God who's coming back. It declares Jesus Christ as God who's coming back and it should make you very happy. It should fill your heart with hope. It's blessed. And I pray that that's you today. I want to ask you that question. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? If you were to die, would you be completely, listen, assured of the fact that at your last breath, you'll meet Christ on good terms? And I want to warn you right now. Listen, I want to warn you. I want to say to you right now, this is what you do not want to say. You do not want to think this. Yeah, I think I'm okay because I was, I'm pretty, I'm okay. I'm pretty good. I I didn't kill anybody. The Bible says you're condemned. If your answer is, well, I'm better than my dad or my mom or my neighbor, or I'm better than anybody else sitting in this room, the Bible says you're condemned. If you say, I'm the most righteous person in the community, you just ask anybody, I'm the best citizen, the Bible says you're condemned. You might say, Jack, boy, you know, you're really laying it on and you let him have it, but I'm the Pope. I'm a priest, I'm a pastor, I'm an evangelist. You're condemned. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And if there's any doubt as to what he meant, he said it to the most spiritual man in all of Israel, Nicodemus. He was the head teacher of the entire nation of Israel. That man, Nicodemus, in his righteousness, trumped everyone up until this day. Nicodemus, his statue, his, his statue before God, his standing before God was better than any televangelist, better than any pastor, evangelist, uh, anywhere in the world, uh, padre, priest, or pope. Nicodemus was the man. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, I tell you, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus said, how can, a, how, how can I, being old, enter into my mother's womb and be born a second time? You see, he got the message that he had to be born a second time, but he was thinking in fleshly terms. And Jesus says, are you not the teacher in all of Israel and you do not know these things? He says, the words that I speak to you regarding this, that which, that which is of the flesh is flesh but that which is of the spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, I tell you, that he who is born from above, born again, will see heaven. Are you born again? That's John chapter three, by the way, if you'd like to read it later. Listen, if you'd like to make that decision, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. I'm gonna ask two things of you, to pray this prayer with me. And I know that's going to be a little uncomfortable because all of a sudden there's somebody sitting in the room next to you and you feel a little weird because you know you're not ready to meet Christ and God has spoken to you and you need Jesus. You need your sins forgiven. and So you're kind of feeling a little odd. But I want to encourage you to be bold and strong. And listen, I know that there's a lot of kids watching right now. Believe it or not, there's a lot of kids that watch our programming. That's a miracle to me. But I want to encourage you young people, you little ones and young ones, you pray this prayer. You get this way better than your parents do. The older we are, the harder it is for us to bow our hearts before Christ. You pray. And then the second thing I'm going to want all of you to do who pray that prayer is to contact us. There's going to be a number on your screen. You're going to be given information on how to contact us. I I want to know. Yes, I made that decision. So no matter where you're at in the world, if you're across the street, which is really weird to me, there's people who attend this church who live just across the street. 
or if you're on the other end of the globe, God can hear you right now, all of us together. Will you, will you pray that prayer? Let's pray. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my life. Wash away my sins and make me new. Because I confess today, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, to be my Lord and Savior. Take away my sins. Put your Holy Spirit in my life. Make me your child. Because I receive you now and I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thanks for watching the Real Life YouTube channel. We love bringing you content that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You can subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss one single video or live stream and you can share it with friends and family. If you'd like to support this ministry by helping us reach others, by taking the gospel and the teaching around the world, you can do so by clicking the Give Now button. So thanks again for watching and God bless.